Well, for one of the nicest introductions I have ever had, I am delighted to be here, to be invited to speak here this morning and to take part in this whole day's program. I am an anthropologist, as you have heard, and as all of you know, anthropology is one of the newest of the behavioral sciences. In fact, we're only about 100 years of age. And in that 100 years, anthropologists of every nation in the world have always gone as far away from home as we possibly could. <laughs> We've gone to all the small islands to study all the different peoples of the world. And if you will ask the anthropologists you know, why don't you ever stay at home, you will discover that we have prepared endless good answers to give you. Sometimes we say these people whom we study, their populations are so small that we can literally stand above their society and look down on it and study society as the anthropologist always wants to do, as a functioning whole. Many times I tell my students at New York University that as this great steamroller, you and I like to call it civilization, as it crosses the earth, it's going to destroy these people, and we want to learn all that we can before they've gone. But I think one anthropologist, Margaret Mead, spoke best for all anthropologists when she wrote in a book some ten years ago, we go to study the simpler people in order that we may learn to ask the right questions, that we may find the right answers before it is too late. And I think that is a key for this whole day, how to ask the right questions so we may find some, at least some, of the right answers. And so I think one of the first questions at least one of the first questions I asked when I was invited to come is, how did this come about? For well, the arguments and the debates of the coeducational residence halls have been going on for many years in higher education. What lay behind this? And the answers are dual, but they are simple. The very name of the man after whom this resident hall, these residence halls, is named. His wisdom and his vision and secondly, the names of those who are being honored by uh, being named after the various wings, having the various wings named after them. But I the point is that in this leadership was also chosen those who would make it and bring it to reality. And so today we have to look and ask a series of questions. What are the forces that really shape and mold all human beings? What are the forces that lead to the directions of life. And of course, the anthropologist has no hesitancy at all here. He answers immediately. There are three of these great forces. The first, of course, is our heredity. And the longer I live, the more I am convinced that the most important choice any baby ever makes in its entire life, it is the choice of its parents. The second great force, of course, which shapes and molds is our environment. But here the anthropologist no longer talks about the physical environment. We talk about the environment of people among whom we live, the environment of values among which we live. And yet all of us who teach know that we ask this question over and over. Why is it two boys born of the same heredity, the same father and the same mother, living in the same environment? Maybe it's here in Indiana. Maybe it's one of our slums back in Manhattan. Maybe it's a tiny farm out in Kansas. Why is it that one of these boys goes on to live a happy, a successful, and a useful life, while the other boy may spend his days in an institution? We have no answer yet to this question. It is one of the most important questions of our time. But I think there is a third force that may in part answer it. It is the force of our personal experiences as we go through life. And all of us who teach hope that in each class we may affect at least one student whose life we may change by the personal experiences, by the goals which we set up. And it seems to me in this sense, this experiment here in this resident hall is an answer to giving to young college students the opportunities for leadership and responsibility, the opportunity to make choices among the vast number of alternatives our society offers alternatives in which too often we offer only two, right or wrong, that which is good and that which is good for you, and very often they're two very different things. And so against this broad background, 
The anthropologist always turns, as you know he would, to the culture in which we live, into the environment, into the values that we call our American way of life. And I don't have to define culture to a group like this. You know very well what the anthropologist is talking about. I might use a personal story that'll set the base when some four years ago I did teach at the University of Innsbruck in Austria. And it turned out I had 500 young men and women who had come from every part of the world. I am an anthropologist, but when I'm traveling abroad, I'm as ethnocentric, I think, as any other traveling American. And when the young man assigned to me to be my interpreter came and said, what could he do? Being an American woman, I had a job for a man to do. And I suggested to him that I had just heard that there were a handful of students in the class who had come from the United States. Could he possibly find out how many they were and who they were? Well, after I got to know him better, I found out that was a very stupid question to have asked, for I left myself wide open. He said, yes, there are some, and I'll find out for you. And so the next morning after my first lecture, and he came to take me to the dining hall, I asked immediately for the statistics. How many from the United States? And he grinned and he said, I don't know, but I promise that I will tell you as soon as lunch is over. And so we had our lunch. And then just before dessert, he took me up to a little balcony that encircled this vast dining room. And as we stood looking down, I suddenly realized that he had arranged to have pie for lunch. And he had also arranged to have each of the waitresses place the slice of pie, either so the point was to the front or the point was to the side. And as I stood looking down, I saw every young man and woman who had come from Europe, from Africa, from Asia, from the islands of the South Pacific, eat that slice of pie exactly the way the waitress had placed it. But all of those who came from the United States, I was able to count every single one, for they all reached out and turned the point towards them. <laughs> that is culture. And though I was assigned that summer to teach about the origins of Europeans, I think I spent the most of my time trying to convince that young man that that's the only correct, the only intelligent, the only possible way to eat a slice of pie. <laughs> and so, as you know, we teach that whether you're born in Fiji or in Indiana, whether you're born in a small tribal group or in a great nation, you are born. You're nursed by your mother, though we're learning today some 70% of the world still does not accept the mother concept. And as you look at new nations like Ghana, as I went out to the villages beyond their capital, there is not yet the acceptance of the biological father such as we know. That there in Ghana today, a father, in order to give something to his son, has to ask the local consul, who is the social father of the son? It is his wife's brother who trains and educates his sons as we carry out across the world the importance of the biological father. And so we have patterns of cleanliness according to our culture. I've never forgotten an Indian boy who said Americans are dirty. You wonder, you resent this, why dirty? And they simply, he simply turned to their sacred tree, the banyan tree, broke off a twig, dipped it in water, thoroughly, almost endlessly, he brushed his teeth. Then he drew it aside, he said, in your country, you use the bristles of a dead animal and you use the same dirty toothbrush morning after morning after morning. Patterns of cleanliness, patterns most important of moral right and wrongs. I used to teach third grade, and when I taught third grade back in Denver, I taught about something known as the American Indians. And when I taught about them, I'm afraid I didn't know much about them except that they had once lived where I was living. I've learned a lot about our Indians since then, those great Indians of the plains, the Indians we have honored with our buffalo nickel. There a father taught his son that the highest honor a man could claim was to steal an enemy horse. And in battle, far better than to kill a man. You rode up, you pushed him off his horse, you stole his horse, and you rode away. And we moved out from the East Coast, and you know what we thought of horse thieves. There are only 37 Westerners on our TVs each week to teach our young people what we thought of horse thieves. We hang them to the highest tree. And so in one society, fathers are busily teaching their sons, it's better to steal a horse than to kill a man. And in the next society, fathers are busily teaching their sons, it's better to kill a man than to steal a horse. And each society says, we have the only answer. And so however we are born, in a hygienic hospital, 
Born as I've seen high in the hills of Mexico, where it isn't the doctor that brings the spark of life, it is a father. A father who must dip each newborn baby into a barrel of ice-cold water. Or out in our southwest, those famous Hopi and Zuni Indians. And no one in this room has escaped the Hopi and Zuni Indians. There it's neither the doctor nor the father that brings that spark, but is always the most sacred person of a society. And there it is the mother-in-law. The mother-in-law who shakes the baby toward the east. Because the east is sacred and from a sacred spot comes the life soul. So however we are born, it is with the crisis of our birth we met our culture. And no matter how long we live, no matter how far away we go, we cannot escape that culture. And today it seems to me that one of the important facts is that too many of our young people are trying to escape their culture. Out in the South Pacific last summer, I met in New Caledonia, New Zealand, everywhere, young American couples fresh out of college meeting every aeroplane that came into their islands. Why had they left? They did not approve of our atomic program, and in their revolt they had run away to the South Pacific to escape it. How can we teach young people as well as our adults that we cannot escape geographically, and that the best plan is to face in living together and to face the common problems here? For against this broad background, we have to place the problems of living in the United States. What are some of the directions of American culture looking at this concept as I've outlined it to you? What are some of the directions that face living in a coeducational residence hall? I think, and you may wonder why I've chosen a few of these that I've chosen, I think one of the major ideas that has importance is the trend of our culture that moves away so subtly from the authority, from the responsibility, from inner discipline that tends to put responsibilities on other people, whether it be on the peer group, whether it be upon a colleague. And so we turn to look, what is this trend? David Reisman has talked about it, as you know so well, in his tradition oriented and other oriented. But Ruth Benedict, long ago I heard her speak, seemed to me to set the pattern, even in the 1940s of the direction of the 1960s. For she pointed out that in every society there are two directions. There is a direction of societies that go and develop towards social conscience, which she called the guilt-ordered societies, while for most of the world she saw rather a save-your-face orientation. And then she asked, why is it that in the West, and particularly in the United States, we have developed this concept of guilt and of social conscience? And she suggested that the major reason was the organization of the families. She said that what you must have is to have just two parents. And you say that all societies have two parents, one mother and one father. But we answer no in anthropology. There are many parents. There are the grandparents and the uncles and the aunts and the nieces and the nephews. All these serve as guides in these families. But in our country, we have just one father and one mother. And so you could close your eyes today, and you could go out to our southwest, to the Hopi and Zuni pueblos, and if you did close your eyes and listen to the words you would hear sp spoken, you would have heard the same words, many of them, a thousand years ago. And the question is, why this conservatism? And one of the questions to ask is, who are the parents among these people? And the answer is, it isn't the parents we know in our society. It is primarily the grandparents. And as I lived on Indian reservations, I came to believe that there was no experience an American Indian could ever have, no matter how traumatic that experience might be. But there was always the wisdom of a grandparent who had lived life to guide them. And then you pick up your newspaper and you read of a revolution among our neighbors to the south. Well, there are many reasons lying behind it, but one of the questions to ask is, who are the parents over much of middle of Latin America and South America? And the answer is, they are not parents such as you and I know, not the grandparents of our Southwest United States. They are, over and over again, little boys and girls, sometimes no more than three or four years older than the child they teach. Once in Lima, Peru, I decided to outstay one of these little boys. At 2 a.m. in the morning, he was still running errands, still with a little brother strapped to his back, the little brother to which he would teach all that child would know of life. Here are parents who have not lived life 
in well over 54% of the population of that area. And then you turn and look at our own society. Two parents, one father and one mother, who want for their children something better than they had, who hope that their children will be professional, who hope that their youngsters will get the education they did not have. Two parents. The second thing Ruth Benedict said that is important is that these two parents should punish their own children. And you look out across the world and say, is this not true everywhere? And the answer is that in so many places of the world, it is not true. It is not the parent who punishes. If you go again to the Southwest, soon they will begin dancing their Katina dances again. And the gods will come back for the period in which they will carry whips and the children will be lined up. Not the bad children, for they don't punish the bad children. They punish only the good ones to make them better. And so it will be the gods who punish. Or it may be, as I saw in Australia, the bull roarers, or the secret societies and masks in Africa, or the formal dances in southeastern Asia. And only here and in the West and in the large cities of the world do parents take the responsibility. And then there's a third factor. Not only must there be two parents and two parents who dare to punish their children, for over and over I've been asked this question, why are we so cruel to children here? Why do we spank them? I try to show them, tell them we picked out the softest place, but they don't believe that this is the right thing. The third thing we need is parents who are the paragons of the perfection which they teach. And after you've got that, never so long as any of us live, we carry with us the memories and the laws and the rules of behavior laid down. My own experience is, is similar, I think, to many of yours when I was in college and high school. I never left home to go out to eat, but my mother always said to me, Now, Ethel, don't forget your manners. It won't be you they blame. It will be your mother. And so through the years, my mother is no longer here, and every time I eat, I hope that I shall eat the way she wanted me to do. And so through this guilt idea, I never approach my classes at NYU after I've finished the one. Have I done it right? If it's particularly successful, where have I failed? In other words, there is a social conscience that arises out of this guilt organization. And what is happening is a subtle trend. We are moving away from the responsibility of the individual, moving away to the larger group and placing the responsibility there. For the other way in which the world approaches it is a save your face. And as you go to Japan and you listen and watch, in Japan the boy raised there always has someone over him and still does today. Always in school, an older student, a teacher. In the army, always a soldier who has been longer, or an officer. And above it all, the emperor of Japan. And so, in so many areas, if you do something wrong and no one is looking, it is perfectly all right. You must save your face only when it is seen. And we are subtly moving into this area. In this whole area of premarital experience, this whole argument that goes on about sex on the campuses of the United States, we are moving forward to the area that only if something happens, then we have to face the issue. And we'd have a permissiveness which does not permit responsibility to use itself to take some inner discipline in relation to these areas. A second trend, I think, that has tremendous importance for what is going to happen here in this residence hall in the next year it's something that is happening to women, to young women all over this country. For I suggest to you there is rising an anti-intellectualism that should give us in the college level pause. If you look, for example, at the figures and you know them well, let me give you just one, that of all our gifted in high school today, only one half of them are going on to college. And of this one half, two-thirds of those who do not go on to college are girls. Two-thirds of the gifted who should be in college are girls. What is happening? You know the answer. Half of our girls today are married before they are 20. We know the facts that families are fulfilled and that by the time of an average age of 26 and a half, a woman has her last child, the average age of 26 and a half. The other day I was drinking coffee and on our turnpike in New Jersey and I was reading about children or babies and the woman who was waiting on me looked down and said, are you interested in them? And I said, yes. And she said, she was too. She had four of them. <laughs> and so I asked her, as I've asked so often, how old were you when the last child was born? 
and she was 24. It is almost impossible to believe this trend, so frightening to the college level of girls who are not going on for higher education. And I picked up an article in Australia of the five reasons that women should have an education as the British saw it. And not one of those five reasons was that it would make her a better wife and a better mother if she had an education. She could get a job, she could get a man, but education in preparing for motherhood was not included among them. And so we have a mass of statistics today of the working woman. We constantly talk that one-third of our labor force is made up of women, that 62% of these women are married women. But hidden within that mass of statistics are many ideas and facts that we should be looking at. And one of the most important I'd like to mention today is the disappearance of the professional woman in the United States. In 1930, 50% of all our professional people were women. Today, or rather in 1960, the census showed only 35%. 30 years ago, 15% of all girls who graduated from college went into the professions. Today, in 1960, only 10.9% are going into the professions. Where are they going? The answer, of course, is that the great majority are going into marriage, which has always been an important area for women. But secondly, 30% of our young people, 19% of all our college graduates who have prepared for professions are becoming secretaries. They are going into the field of typists, of clerical and allied work. Just as mo at the moment, when that electronic voice print is being perfected, and they have said recently in the articles coming out from the Bell Telephone Company, within five years, a typewriter will disappear. Why is this happening? One is, of course, the drainage into marriage. Second is the many new fields that are opening up for which women are not entering. But third and most important is the fact that young men in our country today are paying no attention to the women-only signs. Those seven professions in which four-fifths of all our college graduates enter in teaching, nursing, home economics, and all the rest, we have a new generation of young men who are entering. And so for the first time in over a hundred years, we have more men teaching in high school than we have women. The elementary school principal, long a woman, is disappearing. She is becoming as dead as the dodo bird, for in society and in suburban community after community, and this may be true primarily in the east and west coasts and not so true here, she is disappearing. And for all the women now holding those jobs, seven superintendents, former students of mine, have already told me they know the young men they are going to appoint. In other words, as you look out at the professional woman, you have to ask the question, which of course today we cannot go into much, but it is important and has relevance, I think, to this program of yours. For well, what is happening in campus after campus, in every situation of our larger life, is that girls are not taking over their responsibility. They are stepping back. If you ask why are they becoming secretaries, we know one of the answers is they make a very good salary. We know they don't have to go back to summer school every summer to have a brush up on what they should teach. And if they decide to have children, they do not have to go back to college again, for they can keep their skills in order. But most important, they are fulfilling what is the American outlook, that they are helpers to men. That if a, the, someone fails, they do not fail. It is the man who fails. It is their boss who fails. And if he succeeds, they too succeed. For the professional woman, the successes are so ephemeral, they must be re-earned and re-earned every single day. But most important, the fact of the, what is happening to women is not because of the men in our society, for they are asking in engineering and all other fields that, that women come and apply and train themselves. The major answer, I think, lies in women's attitudes their, themselves. And I would suggest here in this residence hall that one of the major problems that should be faced are the young women in this hall going to take their responsibility? Are they going to do what one commencement in a nurse's uh, school did that I recently was in? There were three men in that nursing class. For today, 96% of nurses are women, but 4% are men, and the number is growing every year. 
three men. One man was the president of the class, one man was the secretary of the class, and one man was the treasurer. <laughs> they gave scholarships for them to go on, and five scholarships were given. Three men got the best ones, even though the faculty said to me they were not the best prepared. But it was the young women in that class who voted on a democratic process to give the men these scholarships. Now, it might be true that there are some, but I think in this experience here, young women have got to ask themselves, is it true what we know that the overwhelming fact of education in America for girls is that it be as good for girls as it is for men? So we then say that after girls have got that education, our society no longer cares what happens to them, nor what they do with it. For face we must, that young girls in our society today fit better into our culture pattern. Ours is a society that is clean. We're always talking about cleanliness. We always say cleanliness is next to godliness. And I always think of it that it's next to impossible for a lot of people. And little girls are cleaner than little boys. And ours is a society that's developing mathematicians and scientists, and we're going to spend all these little boys out into space. And our little boys are inquiring. And we really don't like these inquiring, investigating, dirty little boys of our society. Too many adults. And so little boys grow up in competition with little girls that are cleaner. Little girls who don't ask so many embarrassing questions. Little girls who are larger than little boys in our society and little girls who are smarter on an average. For those who fit closest to the culture tend to be the smartest. And there is a sign that appears in one of our candy stores in New York that I think summarizes it best of all. This sign says this candy is for all little girls and for good little boys. <laughs> And so these not-so-good little boys grow up into an adult world that is far easier for big boys than it is for big girls. And so many of us retreat from our responsibilities. As we go through school and reach the junior high school, girls suddenly find out that uh, perhaps they're not as intelligent. Perhaps they shouldn't go into certain fields. And by the time they get to high school, they really face the issue and they begin to recite their poems to the boys. I'm sorry that I spelt the word. I, I, I hate to go above you because, you see, I love you. And by the time we get them to college, we tell girls they should go into the soft courses. The fields of ideas are not for them. In one large university in this country over the last five years, there has not been a woman appointed a full professor in the area of these ideas, those fields that every student, male and female, should have, the classics, biology, psychology, sociology. In other words, we urge men to come and teach in our elementary schools that our little boys have the image of the masculine role, and yet we are denying to our little girls at every level that they should also see the image of a woman as she moves into the age of automation that is going to have 60% of our population in the professional fields just at the moment as women drop out of it. So I challenge the young people here, will the girls take their responsibility when they are nominated or will they step back? It is true they don't all want to be the officers or take the leadership, but there is a trend in this country that is frightening. Another theme of tremendous importance, I think, and my time is almost gone, let me just hint on it. This is this concept of responsibility the idea of authority in our nation, the idea of leadership. And it stems, I think, primarily from our concept of individualism. And in the large mass of studies on values done on college students, there was one question asked once that interested me very much. They asked the students, what values do you prize? And then the students listed all the ones we hope and expect they'll list. And then they asked this question of all these values that I learned in college. Which one has meant the most to me as an individual? And 93% of these college students answered with exactly the same value. They said something called individualism. In a hundred different ways, they answered the questionnaires. They said, I want to be an individual. I want to be independent at last. I'm free from home. I want to stand on my own feet. I want to solve life's problems by myself. 
And if this is the major value of our college students, and I suggest it is also the major value of our suburbs today, for the suburbs of America are but a reflection of the college campuses of our nation, then we, the adults, had to teach our children to believe this and to want this from the moment they were born. And I'm sure you know we do. We separate the mother from the baby in the hospital, even though the voice of the doctor tells us we'd better get that baby back beside its mother. And I wonder if you've ever taken the time to just sit down and think how long and lonely has been the trip that each one of us has taken to move from babyhood to be sitting here today. First, we were separated from our mothers at birth, in spite of the fact that doctors say we shouldn't do it. And you move from there to our own playpen, and the walls around those playpens are growing higher with each year that passes, because we've got another value. Furniture and wall-to-wall -wall carpeting are important. From there to our own high chair that we may eat alone and correctly. From there to our own bed. And there is a dream that most parents have today, a dream of another trip their children will take, a dream which lies in part behind this great surge to the suburbs. A surge so vast, as you know, the ecologists are pointing out, 25 years from now, a single city from Boston to Washington, 30 to 35 years, a single city from Detroit to Pittsburgh and from Pittsburgh to Buffalo. And that is the dream that if you live in the city, you will move out of the city. You'll get a house large enough that each of your children will have a room of his own. And two psychologists describing the college student titled the book, A Room of One's Own. And if you wonder why they say, I titled it that, they say in the preface, we in the United States, we need a room of our own, a room to be alone in, a room to grow in. And so we do indeed teach individualism. And from the first moment a mother hires her first babysitter until a little girl is 13 and goes upstairs and closes the door and mother says, what have I done? How have I failed my daughter? Or the little boy unable to go up and close the door that isn't masculine in the United States and he begins his daydreaming and his fantasy and his arithmetic grades start to go down. And nothing is worse in the United States than a little boy's arithmetic grades to go down. And this is the first time perhaps they are really facing the issue of individualism. But can we face also here in this kind of experiment that we're teaching not only individualism, but we're teaching separateness, we're teaching apartness, and we're teaching aloneness. And that as we face the college students, the many foreign students in New York say to me, you New Yorkers, you are the loneliest people in the world. Yes, all people are lonely, but for most cultures, it's the middle years that we find the richest. But for us, our lonely periods, I think, are too. Adolescence, from 18, 16 to 21, stretching toward adulthood in a world that would hold its youth to babyhood as long as we possibly can. And we're all going to be lonely once again, lonely as we start to grow old. And so we have this concept of individualism without really teaching the responsibilities of individualism and the true concept, for with it is another one, the concept of conformity, because this is important, one, and we have taught our children to conform from the moment they're born. I always think of grandparents looking at a crawling baby, or parents, or the doting aunts and uncles, and as they watch the baby, they compare that crawling baby with every baby that ever crawled in the world before. And as their children walk, talk, and especially look at the opposite sex, parents compare their children with their peers. Then they send them to school, and those of us who teach, what do we do? Exactly the same thing. I taught physical education for a while, and I used to stand up in front of my gymnasium, and I'd say to my girls, Mary, why can't you ever learn to keep your locker? as neat and clean as Jane always keeps her locker. And so in college level, we do tend to compare not only their abilities, but their attitudes as well. And the years begin to pass, and one day Mary goes home and says, Mother, may I stay out till one o'clock? And maybe it's Tuesday night, and Mother says, Of course you can't stay out till one o'clock. And Mary will give the answer we have taught her since she was born. But Jane can stay out till one o'clock, but mother, everybody else can stay out to one o'clock. And mother, for perhaps the first time in her life, says, we don't care what everybody else can do. 
Your father says you must be in at 12 o'clock. And so at this mystical moment that grows younger with each year that passes, we toss the learnings of a lifetime out the window and we bring in new values, the ones that should have been there all along. How can you, in this living together here, face this idea of individualism and responsibility and the idea of conformity? For conform we must in certain areas of our lives. But so much of our conformity and the part of young people is a conformity like their adults in material things. And we look at each other's cars and our split-level houses and our TVs, and youth does its revolt, for it isn't true. Revolt is imitation of the adult. They do it in terms of material things and primarily in terms of clothing. And so I have a, uh, an apartment in Greenwich Village, and I watch the young men and women there and know several of them quite well, and they tell me they are the most non-conforming, the most daring youth in the United States. And I can't resist looking at them very closely. The young man in their tight black pants, so tight they really can't walk, they have to wiggle. The black shirts, the uncut hair, the unshaved face. No, these are the most conforming youth our country has. Can you hear show through living together a challenge of what is meant by conformity in terms of the laws? of a democratic way of life? What is individualism in terms of how dare we stand out against the conformity of a peer-oriented society, of a society that moves towards seeing what everyone else does before we face our own responsibility? And last, one quick and yet important point, and it goes to this question that you will be asked everywhere, this question of sex on the campuses of the United States. And well, you know the announcement and the statement President Sarah Blanding made to her students at Vassar, questioning the drinking and premarital experiences and suggesting that any who broke the law would be expelled, and the wild revolt that came to that and everybody answering, and the issue, as pointed out, is not the issue as the president of a college or university, have the administrators and those who are working together in the faculty and these residence halls, have they the right to set down the laws? This is not the issue at all. That whether or not they come out for or against premarital experience. Not, as Margaret Mead have pointed out, whether the private life of a young man or woman, so long as it is kept private, is the property of the business of the larger campus life and the larger society. The issue is that we are today with this romantic love concept pushing early marriage and early marital experiences younger and younger. When I was in college, we were worried about marriages at the college level, and they were not allowed to stay in college, and you know the difference today. This moved on in the 40s to questions of premarital unwanted children in the high school. And as you know today, it has reached down into the junior high school. And in many areas, like in New York City or out in Los Angeles, it is pushed down into the upper elementary grades. And we have had in New York City this past year three girls, age eight, three white girls who have had babies. What is happening and what is the responsibility at the college age? For the issue is that if our young girls cannot themselves control their curiosity, cannot themselves see inner responsibility, what we have failed, and many of you may argue, that in the United States it is a woman who is the conscience of the young man. For one hand, we have the trend that he must try as best he can, and that the responsibility of the girl is to be that conscious. Yet somehow, as Margaret Mead says, we at college level are condoning all of this, that so long as it ends in marriage, all is well. And as she writes today, that we have not a young pregnant girl, but a young pregnant couple who are effectively blackmailing society that has only reluctantly accepted the fact that sex is good even within marriage. I think in this whole undertaking, one of the questions is that all of the United States and many of those who are reluctant to dare to give our youth responsibility, who dare to offer them the alternatives within which they must work, who dare to ask them for leadership, they are going to ask, what does it mean in this whole area of premarital experience and what gains the headlights in our country, sex on the local campus? For I would like to close with a story that I think illustrates best what I've really tried to say. 
Here's a story that comes from Montgomery, Alabama, and from that famous bus strike. And it tells of an old, old woman who was found walking down one of the dusty roads early one morning, and a young man came by, and he said to her, Grandmother, you're too old to walk. Why don't you ride the bus and let the young ones walk for you? You can just almost see this old woman raising up to her full height as she said to him, but I'm not walking for myself today. I'm walking for my grandchildren. How can we say in every experiment, in every adjustment that more nearly reaches the reality of our culture and of the world, how can we say the heavy load that is borne, it is true, yet all of us, we walk today not for our children, not even for our grandchildren, I believe very deeply in the leadership of the United States. We walk today for all mankind.